the main event. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the topic and then I'm going to introduce our speaker. Because the topic made me think back to the 1970s when I was a cub reporter in Scarborough and I was assigned to cover a civic committee for people with physical disabilities. It was an initiative to remove grocery, uh, grocery shopping cart barriers from in front of stores. Do you remember those things? They were metal poles, stop people from stealing shopping carts. And I was challenged to negotiate my way through those and or just to negotiate my way around in a wheelchair. And eventually what happened is they took those silly things down because people with wheelchairs couldn't use grocery stores if they were there. In 1987, I chaired a special events and protocol for the Ontario Games for the Physically Disabled. And that was held in North York, the first truly integrated event at the newly built Novotel Toronto, uh, Novotel North York, which was Toronto's first fully accessible hotel. So that was the first hotel to have the elevator buttons at a reasonable level, you know, the braille on the sides, ramps, easy access, wide doors. They had done it all. And this is before the Ontario Ontarians for Disabilities Act. So it was very quite exciting to see that. And my awareness of disability issues grew even deeper when I worked at Queen's Park on children and youth files. The largest one by far was the autism file. And so I have a special appreciation for the type of work Ed is doing to advance the cause of employing neurodivergent persons and opening eyes about people with disabilities. So let me tell you about Ed who has earned distinction as a journalist, public affairs consultant, teacher, author, and publisher, 15 years in journalism, holding senior editorial positions with the New York Times News Service, the uh, Reuters News Agency, Radio Denmark, and the Toronto Star, contributing to Newsweek, the London Sunday Times, the Financial Times of London, and many other leading newspapers and magazines. Then a public affairs executive for Denison Mines Limited, Kid Creek Mines Limited and the Canadian Manufacturers Association. And subsequently, Ed founded Ed Schiller Communications, which listed hundreds of leading North American organizations among its clients. And Ed is an author. See, I remembered to bring. <laughs> In the Spotlight, The Essential Guide to Giving Great Media Interviews. And he also wrote The Canadian Guide to Managing the Media and is a teacher of communications at Seneca College and the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. I, I, I should say has, has taught there. Ed is founder and principal of Yorkland Publishing. He's spoken to us once before, as have his authors, William Boardman on American Exceptionalism, we remember that one, and Howard Mosco, who was here talking about his career in Toronto politics. And of course, you know, as I've said before, I would most like to introduce Ed as the publisher of my future bestseller, The Letters. <laughs> this morning's presentation will advocate creating employment opportunities for neuro, di neurodivergent people. Employing people with disabilities is not only the right thing to do morally, it is also the smart thing to do from a business point of view. So we'll delve into the barriers that prevent people with disabilities from entering the workforce, and we will hear about solutions that will promote barrier-free access to meaningful employment and career development. And now I will call on Ed Schiller. Hi everyone, and, and thank you, Sheila, for a very thorough introduction. And I do want to say that the Sheila's book is now, I would say, in the near final stages of editing. Um, and the next step is going to get it designed. And the next step after that is going to get it printed. And I think what I will do is actually begin to offer sometime probably next month uh, opportunities to purchase advanced copies, pre-publication copies of the book. So you'll all be able to get to read it, hopefully by the spring. Okay, And then you can read it on and on and on. It'll be a very interesting book. <laughs> Um, when, when, when Sheila invited me to, to speak here today about creating employment opportunities for neuro, neurodivergent people, I, I quickly accepted. 
Um, one of the reasons was is that I had been writing extensively about, extensively about the topic for uh, the past several months on behalf of a client and uh, would merely, I thought, draw upon what I had written. Um, um, and to some degree, that is, in fact, what I've done in parts of this presentation. Um, but then, then I began musing about the broader aspects um, of the topic at hand, and things then started getting complicated. I found myself wander, wandering into the realm of, of speculation rather than certainty, um, explore, exploration rather than discovery, questioning rather than answering, and wishing rather than inspiring. But that's okay, because speculation, exploration, questioning, and wishing are themselves uplifting and often inspire creativity and the, under, and the uncovering of hitherto unknown truths. You know, perhaps truths, in fact, is too strong a word. One can legitimately question whether anything can accurately be said to be true, at least in an absolute sense. We do live in a world of uncertainty, flux, and mystery. But if we don't have absolute truths, at least we have informed beliefs, and beliefs evolve. My desire is that we evolve into a more just society, one in which every person has the means to live a sustainable, fulfilling life, both physically and spiritually. I envision a classless society in which opportunities for personal fulfillment are equally available to everyone. I see a world in which differences in race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, and abilities are not walls that divide us, but rather are opportunities to bring us together in celebratory harmony. I will share some of these thoughts with you as they relate to the matter of disabilities. And I'll begin by ad addressing the factual specifics of the topic of my presentation, creating employment opportunities for neurodivergent people. The word neurodivergent, uh, just in case you're not that familiar with it, describes someone who behaves, thinks, or learns differently from what those who are considered to be, and I stress considered to be neurotypical. This may include people with autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, Tourette syndrome, dyslexia, and other neurodiverse conditions. Ongoing efforts to create inclusivity, inclusivity for people with neurodiverse conditions and other disabilities have made significant progress in recent years. Uh, for example, the principal goal of the uh, Accessible Canada Act, I think which was passed just about three years ago, um, is to make Canada barrier free by January 1st, 20, sorry, Feb, uh, yeah, January 1st, 2040. The act mandates identifying, removing, and preventing barriers in various activities under federal jurisdiction. You know, among these are buildings and public spaces, information and communications technologies, the procurement of goods, services, and facilities, air, rail, marine, and road transportation, and employment. The facts, however, show that we still have a long way to go as thousands of neurodivergent individuals in Canada are denied the opportunity for meaningful employment and with it the means to attain many of their personal life goals. About 6.2 million people in Canada live with a disability, yet only 59% of disabled adults of working age are employed compared to 80% of those without a disability. And for the hundreds of thousands of neurodivergent people in Canada, the rate of employment drops to a mere 26%. The underrepresentation of neurodivergent individuals in the workplace does not reflect their actual talents, their skills, or their employability. What it does reflect is a lack of accessibility to the mainstream labor market. The vast majority of neurodivergent individuals is willing and able to work, and with the right supports can make valuable social and economic contributions to society. Among the barriers uh, to mainstream employment are 
Lack of work experience prior to leaving school. Limited professional and social networks. Lack of accessibility in the recruitment process. Technology related challenges. Workplace disclosure of an employee's neurodivergent condition. Appropriate clothing. You know, mandated uniforms or dress codes may not accommodate an individual's disability. And I also might say also accommodate some of their religious obligations. Uh, physical, dis uh, physical challenges with workplace environments is another barrier, as is uh, transportation challenges uh, and long and a lack of long-term working supports. Among the solutions, creating more opportunities for post-secondary vocational training, developing programs to promote job advancement, self-employment, and business ownership, ensuring that neurodivergent employees, as well as people with physical disabilities, receive fair wages without losing eligibility for needed public assistance, and tapping into the often unique contribution that people with disabilities can make to any business's long-term success. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, there are a growing number of companies that eagerly review job applications from autistic people because autism often accompanies an exceptional ability to concentrate and think creativity, creative, creatively. The challenges facing inclusive employment may be demanding, but the rewards are enormous. According to the Canadian manufacturers and, and exporters' uh, latest annual labor survey, labor and skill shortages during the past year alone have caused economic losses in Canada, totaling nearly $13 billion. And labor market statistics indicate that the number of people seeking employment for each job vacancy now stands at historic lows. And that's even despite today's economic uncertainty and disruption caused in part by the COVID epidemic. The benefits to all of society of overcoming the challenges of truly inclusive employment are enormous. Enhanced employment opportunities for neurodivergent people will significantly ease recurring labor shortages, spur economic growth, increase prosperity for all Canadians, and help millions lead more joyful and fulfilling lives. To eliminate the barriers to inclusive employment, employers need to think differently about disabilities and take action to improve how they recruit, train, and retain employees. Policymakers, healthcare workers, educators, architects, and engineers must work collaboratively to create inclusive and accessible work environments. They must also advocate for social change within and beyond their organizations. Making Canada truly inclusive and consequently more prosperous is not only the obligation of government and humanitarian organizations. That obligation also falls squarely upon the shoulders of every single Canadian. And indeed, there is a significant sector in the Canadian economy that has taken up these challenges. I'm referring to social enterprises. These are nonprofit and for-profit organizations that generate revenue and incidentally employ thousands of disabled people by selling goods and services and reinvesting the majority of their profits into social into their social mission, the local community, or a sponsoring charity. Employment social enterprises. This is employment social enterprises are a subcategory of social enterprises that focus primarily on creating training um, and, employ and employment opportunities and providing customized supports for people with disabilities. Employment social enterprises vary in size from small ventures of under $10,000 to multi-million dollar undertakings and operate in urban, suburban, and rural communities across various industries and sectors. There are, however, distinctions among employment social enterprises. Some support employment initiatives that exist parallel to the mainstream um, competitive labor market. That is, they provide jobs that are often menial and repetitive. 
These employers do not usually offer additional training that would enable advancement within the organization or opportunities for career development outside of the organization. Other employment social enterprises, however, provide skills training, encourage career development, include their disabled employees in decision-making, and facilitate entry into the mainstream labor market. It is the latter of these two types of employment social enterprises that make the greater contribution to employment inclusivity. The work of government humanita uh, humanitarian agencies and social enterprises, however, will not create true employment equity if we don't address perhaps the greatest barrier to employment for disabled people in general and for neurodivergent people in particular. This is the low societal expectations and the reluctance of many to embrace, to embrace true inclusive, inclusiveness. The initial challenge for those who consider themselves able-bodied is to acknowledge any discomfort they may have about working with, social or in, socially interacting with, and accommodating people who appear to act differently for, from what is considered to be the norm. The second challenge is to overcome that discomfort. And here is where I will venture into the world of speculation rather than certainty, of exploration rather than discovery, of questioning rather than answering, of hoping rather than inspiring, of thought provoking rather than pontificating. I have a nagging concern that our societal practice of dividing humanitarian hum humanity into one of two camps, abled or disabled, may actually stand in the way of overcoming this second challenge. I wonder whether labels themselves are, are constrictive, that they place people in boxes, perhaps cages would be a better word, that created significant barriers to personal fulfillment. And perhaps the, the most concerning is that we come to accept as valid the labels that others impose upon us in effect, we enable our own barriers, our own cages. And we thus, uh, and, and I question then, are we actually falling victim to the stereotypes that others have of us? Or conversely, are we ourselves creating barriers by imposing stereotypes on others? I therefore suggest that we abandon the conventional meaning of what constitutes a disability. Am I physically disabled because I can't hit the ball out of the park or swoosh a three-pointer? Am I intellectually challenged because I don't have a working grasp of the special theory of relativity, can't solve quadratic equations, speak only one language, or have difficulty understanding the Canterbury Tales as Chaucer wrote them in Middle English? Am I disabled because my apparent lack of Acting talent always relegates me to the role of sales, sales clerk number two, <laughs> number three, maybe. <laughs> uh, and because seeming lack of coordination relegates me to batting ninth and playing right field in an, in an intramural sport, uh, softball game. Each one of us has a range of abilities and disabilities with, with respect to the almost unending list of human, intellectual, and physical activities. So where do we place the dividing line between abled and disabled? Well, I don't believe that we really can because the dividing line between abled and disabled is in constant flux. The line is continually moving in response to evolving technologies, values, and understanding. So perhaps it might be best to stop labeling people as either able or disabled. We call someone disabled because that person can't do something that society believes he or she should be able to do. Expectations themselves can be barriers. So in effect, if we eliminate the barriers of expectation, that there would be no distinction between an abled or a disabled person. We would be left with the simple and perhaps unconscious task of acknowledging that individuals vary. And in response, we would try to accommodate them 
as best we can. So let's take a paradigm shift and think less about disabilities and more about differences. And with that in mind, let's focus on accommodating as many people as possible in any given situation in a practical sense. For example, when writing, use plain language geared to your audience. And here I would say, I probably use some plain language principles, but I haven't used plain language throughout. Um, when building a house, a website, or a workplace for ourselves or others, design it to accommodate the greatest number of people by using the latest accessibility practices and technologies like Novotel did. Okay. The paradigm shift also refers to everyday situations. Not everyone has the skills we have, or perhaps pretend we have, to drive smoothly through heavy traffic, to efficiently unpack and repack the carts at the supermarket checkout, um, ease effortlessly in or out of a tight parking space. Not everyone speaks our language, or when they do, um, not um, as articulately or as quickly as we might like. Some people are strong and adept enough to whiz their their carry-on luggage from the overhead bin without skipping a beat, while others do so more slowly and less effectively, more clumsily, uh, and move uh, more clumsily along the exit aisle. And this is what I experienced when I got off the plane from Mexico last night or the night before last. So let's be more patient and accepting of what we might perceive as other shortcomings. Or better still, let's not think of them as shortcomings at all. Likewise, we we might hope that others who experience our impatient would not regard that as a shortcoming, though it is a behavior that needlessly causes annoyance in others, and that's what one might uh, well wish to change. In my ideal world, the dichotomy between abled and disabled would be, be replaced by a Mobius strip that recognizes, accepts, accommodates, and celebrates our individuality just as we recognize, accept, accommodate, and celebrate our individual cultural, ethnic, racial, religious, and gender identities. It's not that our differences don't matter. They do matter. Not as a fomenter of discord, but rather as a source of enrichment. Now, is my ideal world attainable? I would say yes, insofar as any idea is attainable which is to say, no, it is not. But isn't the journey, not the final destination, that makes life really rewarding? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.